Hey friends, Erin from The Impatient Gardener. Right behind me are two trees you might recognize. Pagoda dogwoods, guess where those came from? Yep, today I'm gonna to show you how this all came together, how these trees that you might recognize from the driveway containers, and when I planted those two years ago, um, have now ended up here and what was involved in that. Now, two things ended up in our yard while this process was going on that aren't usually here. One, uh, we rented a tractor uh, to help with this project and do a couple other things around here. We've been actually talking about buying a tractor for a long time and uh, they're just extremely expensive and we just weren't sure you know, where do you keep it? Is it really worth it? Are we gonna use it enough to justify that expense? So we just rented it for a weekend to see what would happen. Um, and so we use that for this project. You're gonna see that come together. And then also a uh, pheasant came walking by in the middle of this video. So that was sort of crazy. Don't know what he was doing, but he didn't seem the least bit concerned about anything we were doing. Now, since we had the tractor here anyway, we used it for everything we could, including combining the compost pile. So I've got two bins next to each other. So we flipped everything from one bin. The compost that's actually mostly finished, towards the bottom it was actually finished compost, into the other bin to try to kickstart that one a little bit. And then we're gonna start fresh in the first bin, um, layering leaves and green stuff that's coming out of the garden. Cause right now is when I do most of my compost building. But this area was a real mess. It was covered with this grass, um, which when I finally identified it, I learned is one of the worst invasive species in the state of Wisconsin. I seem to have, if there's anything ever listed as a bad invasive species, it seems to end up here. So one of the things we used that tractor for was scraping all that other. It's not gonna solve this problem. We're gonna have to stay on top of it, but I let it get so out of hand this year that I had to start from somewhere. Um, it will absolutely come back and I will have to come up with a strategy for managing that for the time being. Um, but this took care of it for now. Okay, so reed canary grass is by some accounts, perhaps the worst invasive plant species in the state of Wisconsin. It clogs up waterways, which, which is what makes it particularly dangerous. And that's exactly how I got it in my yard. Our whole drainage ditch along our road is full of it. Undoubtedly in a rainstorm, a seed fell in there, came down our little drainage area crick and uh, implanted itself in that bank and just took over in just two years. So while Mr. Rutchmore patient is over there cleaning the last of that out, we are gonna start trying to figure out how to get these out of this pot. So the important tool we're using for this is my bread knife from my kitchen. Uh, it's not a very good one, if that's any consolation. Uh, this is what I do sometimes. This is sometimes how I end up getting new stuff for my house because things get repurposed in the garden. Seriously though, um, it's either Nawaki or Sneebor makes a tool specifically for what I'm trying to do here, which is essentially like, you know, when you're cutting a cake out of a pan and you need to run a knife along the edges, this is the same thing to get this out of a pot because obviously uh, this pot is not going to be flexible and there's actually a little lip on it. So there's plenty of, it could get stuck there. So um, the tool that they use is quite large or make is quite large and it uh, has um, blades on both sides. So you just stick it straight down and move around. Uh, I don't have this, but I'm going to try to get the top with this and then see if I can sneak a spade in there to sort of run along the rest of it and see how we do with that because I don't know what else to do. Okay, so now that we have those trees planted, 
uh, and we've sort of raked everything out, smoothed everything out, pulled out all the junk that came out of those holes, all of that. Uh, now we're working on mulching this. This is all with arborist chips. These are all chips actually from the tree that came down right here and the two um, right behind the camera here. Um, and this is really good stuff. So we're going to put a nice thick layer on this. Um, this will break down. We're going to put down about probably a, ideally about a five inch thick layer here. That will really help with the weed suppression in this area. And I'm very concerned about that because now that we've taken those trees down, this area has a lot more sun on it. And I have a sneaking suspicion the weeds are going to go crazy here. So we'll put a nice thick layer of mulch here that will break down and we'll do some planting here uh, in the future. But for right now, it's really about weed suppression and then also building up the soil because I don't know if you could tell the soil in this area is extraordinarily sandy. So it really needs bulking up. So that organic matter that's gonna get created as those arborist chips break down is gonna be really good for the soil. Okay, so getting those trees out of those pots was way harder than I thought. For, I should just have bought that tool. I think that tool would have saved everything. I wish I had bought that tool. I think I'm probably gonna buy that tool so I have it the next time I need it. Uh, anyway, the one was really hard to get out. As you can see, uh, we struggled and pulled and whatever. The next one was not nearly as bad. It was incidentally, one of them was slightly bigger and the bigger one was more difficult to get out. So I think maybe we can assume there were more roots there. I don't know, the roots look the same to me. So I didn't tease the roots at all when we planted these. You know, what I didn't see, especially because we cut basically around the whole edge, so all the roots on the side, but I didn't see any sign of like girdling roots. And even at the bottom, I didn't see like a big mass of roots at the bottom. So I don't really think it was necessary. So I didn't do that. And the only thing I put in the hole was, um, what I've been using this year is Organics Mechanics uh, Forget About It which is like the best name for a product ever. Um, they're little planter packs. And so they come in little, a little paper sachet and there's mycorrhizal fungi in there and biochar and a few other things. So I'm really happy with how this turned out. It actually is, I, I, wasn't, I was having a little bit of a hard time picturing it. I'm really happy with how it turned out. So first of all, it's nice to have this area cleaned up. It was looking really bad with all that grass in there. Now again, that grass is gonna continue to be a battle for me. I have it in a few other spots too. Um, I dug out a few chunks of it. It's, it's just a disaster. It's really a mess. And uh, I'm going to have to just research some ways of dealing with that. You know, the problem with that is that sometimes with these really invasive species, it is actually um, good to have the option of using some sort of herbicide on it um, because really it's the best way to deal with them long term. Uh, it's sort of a, you know, not, not a great thing to have to do, but it's the best in the long run to just be able to get rid of it. Unfortunately, anytime you're dealing with a plant that lives on the periphery of water, herbicides are not an option because you definitely cannot take the chance of an herbicide ending up in a waterway. So that's never an option when you're, when you're next to a waterway. So I'll keep dealing with that. But the great thing is, is that hopefully this arborist, um, these arborist chips laid on there really thick will help suppress everything, every kind of weed, hopefully including that. And then I'm gonna come up with a strategy over winter to better deal with that so that when it pops up, I can deal with it then instead of letting it turn into what it turned into this year, which was really, really a bad thing to let happen. I think the Pagoda Dogwoods fit really well in this spot. They're gonna get about half a day of sun. They're gonna get more sun, I think, you know, until early afternoon and then they'll be in shade, which is exactly what I think they're gonna really like. Um, they're not gonna get too tall. One of the things we've noticed since we cut down this tree um, and the trees on the other side is that we have a clear view of our um, beech trees that we really love over here uh, from the house. So we really like that look and these won't obscure that view because you know we're kind of looking at it um, from above. And they have that nice layered kind of open habit, which I think is, is really beautiful. I, lo I love those layered, that layered tiered habit in trees. So let's just talk quickly about cost. When I bought these Pagoda Dogwoods, they were very, I thought, reasonably priced. I wanna say $60, $65 a piece in a three gallon can. And um, I got two years in a container out of them. So just think about how much a centerpiece in a big container can cost you per year. And now they're trees in the landscape. And even if you added in the cost it took us to rent the tractor, I think it's still worth it. By the way, that had really nothing to do with it. We were just lazy and didn't wanna dig the holes. We certainly could have dug those holes by hand. Um, so that was, I think that is a really good bang for your buck. 
All right, I hope you have a great day in your garden and we'll see you soon, bye. This cheeky pheasant's coming through here and I bet it's going to come and have another go at these primroses, but it's going to get a surprise in a minute. Go on, go on. It's gone, but it didn't squawk. <laughs>